to see such a such a good solid turnout. Um, I want to mention uh, from the beginning here. You know, the reason I suggested that we have this meeting is because when the ferry rates were the increase was announced, um, the calls I was getting about the about the ferry, which you know it's understandable when your rate goes up, you're going to get calls about that, but. Um, when I would have those interactions with people, I'd ask them what their plan was for the high water that's been projected for next year, and pretty consistently um, got not much of a response on that, uh, not much of a solid plan. And so this this meeting was was designed to be one to make sure that we're getting the word out of, of what is the potential for Clay Township next year. Um, certainly, we're going to talk about the ferry and you know the failure of the dock and all that. Um, really, really brought this to a head, and, and I, so I know we're going to have time for that. But, but I want to remind everybody from the beginning, and, and that's why I'm so glad to see so many people here. Um, that, you know, I want to make sure you walk away from here with the information you need for for putting together an emergency plan if needed for next spring. So high water is affecting the entire state. And high water will probably affect Clay Township more than anywhere in the state. Or ground zero. <laughs> yeah, we'll be our ground zero. So, um, some introductions to start with, and, and Justin, you're going to have to help me because some of these guys I don't know as well as you do. So, maybe I'll um, thank Artie for, for allowing us to use the Township Hall here and then turn it over to Justin so that you can introduce the, the folks that we have here as our specialists today. Yes, sir. So, uh, we've got Keith Kompaltowicz with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Pat Cooney, the Director for Emergency Management with the Army Corps of Engineers. I'm Justin Westmiller, the Director for Homeland Security and Emergency Management with uh, St. Clair County. Uh, Dr. Annette Mercantant, the Chief Medical Officer for St. Clair County Health Department. And uh, we've got a Sergeant with the DNR, Sergeant. Chris Maher. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Artie, the Township Supervisor, Artie Bryson. He is our gracious host, and, and as the senator said, obviously, thank you, sir, for, for allowing us to hold Thank you for coming, and, everybody. Uh, senator? Sure. Well, uh, with that... Um, you want to recognize, like, we have Gary Ice. Oh, yeah, I should. There's, yeah. Other, Absolutely. there's other elected officials Just stand, here that... Uh, stand. Um, state Representative <laughs> Gary Eisen's here. He's your state rep for this area. Uh, Pamela, Representative Pamela Hornberger is here. Um, and Representative Shane Hernandez is here as well. So we've, we've got everybody that even comes in contact with St. Clair County here today. So thank you all for coming. Uh, Bill Graytop, our commissioner, and uh, Carrie Hepting is here. She, she controls the money in the county. And, and so uh, we have money questions. We can, we can get first firsthand answers from her. Um, owners of Champions Auto Ferry are, are here as well. So we will be able to get direct information there if we need it. Trying to think who else I met that would uh, have that direct information for us. And we do have one, I think we still have one flood insurance representative here, but I know that person's got to leave before the meeting's over, so if we get to those questions. So, with that, I think we should start with the Army Corps. Is there anyone else we missed here? Dan, what I was going to say is for those of you in the back of the room that are in the doorway, if you want to come in and sit in the front of the room, uh, we don't have any more chairs left. I, are they on? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, if you if you want to come in and sit on the floor, you're more than welcome. I know it's uh, it's it's less than <coughs> desired and ideal, but uh, it is open instead of standing, so you're more than welcome to. We'll get you out. Yeah. We'll get down. Flexible. Yeah, yeah. We'll get you out. We're more flexible, flexible citizens. Right. Yes. So, so how this is going to go this morning? Uh, I'm going to co-chair the, the flooding response uh, portion of the event this morning. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith and Patrick, and they're going to provide the first presentation for uh, for the Army Corps. So Keith? Is All there right. an order to the agenda that we could discuss and that get lost in the minutiae of where we are in the water? Yeah. It's that should yep. be yep. yep. the agenda. Yep. Do the people speak to what the order of that agenda should be? No. Um, I. Yeah, we're going to have plenty of time. I hope so. Yeah. So yeah, this should, is a, we'll give you a timeline. Actually, the 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 presentation should take 45 minutes. Yeah, there is discussion at so the end. So there's time for discussion at all. Of those. 
Well, because let's, we're let's move have, on with the meeting, please. Yeah, we're going to have it at the end. So, all right. Keith. All right, great. Um, again, my name's Keith Kompaltowicz. I'm chief of the watershed hydrology branch. Uh, for the Corps of Engineers in Detroit, and my staff does the water level forecasting and analysis for the, the Great Lakes. So I have some slides to kind of go over how we got here, uh, where we expect to go uh, over the next uh, several months. There are some paper copies, um, in the, so uh, please follow along if you have uh, paper copies. But uh, first, uh, uh, a slide that we've been showing quite often um, as the, the Great Lakes high water really is a Great Lakes wide event. So uh, we've been doing a version of this presentation quite often, uh, really since last fall when we first started seeing uh, the, the potential for uh, high and even record high water levels on the lakes. So, you know, first, um, from the Corps of Engineers' perspective, we're really not concerned about depth when we're talking about water level forecasting. We're, we're projecting an elevation of the water surface above sea level. Uh, we consider Lakes Michigan and Huron to be one lake because they're joined at the Straits of Mackinac, which means they rise and fall together. Uh, we are really focused on the mean surface water level of the entire lake, not necessarily at one specific point. And the water levels at specific points are significantly influenced by meteorological forcing, wind, storms. Uh, and the Corps of Engineers doesn't necessarily get into the forecasting of those water level, uh, short-term water level events. Again, we are forecasted on uh, the surface elevation of the entire lake. We use a network of gauges that are located in both the United States and Canada. Um, and we are the official keeper of those lake-wide statistics, um, and our period of record goes back to 1918. Uh, we do significant coordination with our counterparts in Environment and Climate Change Canada, as we want to make sure that the messaging in terms of our forecasting and statistics are consistent across the international border. And I, I bolded this last point because the, it's, it's important to, to, to drive home is that the primary drivers of water level fluctuations are the changing weather patterns and the resulting fluctuations in water supply. And we'll kind of go through what that means through the next series of slides. So the, the factors impacting water level, I want to focus first on uh, the quantities circled in red. Uh, precipitation that's falling directly on the lake surface, uh, runoff from the surrounding land, minus evaporation. That quantity is known as the net basin supply. You know, that's what comes in from rainfall and snow melt and river flows of all the tributaries that feed the lakes. When you lump that together, again, known as the net basin supply, you take an inflow from the upstream lake, and all the lakes have an inflow from the upstream lake except Lake Superior, um, you lump those quantities together, the net basin supply and the inflow, you get the net total supply. And it's if the net total supply is greater than the outflow to the next downstream lake, water levels will rise. Opposite is true if the net total supply is lower than the outflow, uh, then water levels will decline. We spend a lot of our time, Corps of Engineers, focusing on that net basin supply number. How is that number going to change? Uh, how is it, uh, is, is, are there trends? Are we seeing wetter conditions? And obviously the answer to that recently has been yes. So each of the lakes also have a, a seasonal pattern. Uh, they, they're at their low in the winter as precipitation accumulates typically on the ground in the form of snow rather than falling as liquid and, and making its way directly into the lakes. As that snowpack builds, we get into the spring, uh, the temperature's warm, uh, releases that water in the snowpack, and we also start to get more liquid precipitation. That drives the lake's seasonal rise in the springtime. Get into the summer months, the lakes are warming. Uh, they peak in the summer. At the same time they're reaching their peak, they're at their 
you know, warmest typical temperatures, and then we get the seasons change again to the fall, and we get the cold, dry air moving over the still warmer waters of the lakes, and that drives evaporation, and that pulls the lakes down. And depending on the lake, the fluctuation between high and low in a given year is anywhere between 12 and 16 inches on average, and that's, again, based on that 100-year period of record back to 1918. Here's that period of record that I talked about. So we'll, we'll add so a couple of, um, point out a couple of things here. Um, and the, how to interpret this, the, the blue line is the recorded monthly mean water level. The red line is the long-term average. And each rise and fall of that blue line represents that seasonal fluctuation, that seasonal pattern of rising in the spring, declining in the fall. The, the red shaded area on this slide is, is marked by a persistent period of low water levels and even record low water levels. The two red circles signify record low water levels for Lake Superior and Lakes Michigan Huron in 2007 and 2013 in, uh, for Lakes Michigan Huron. And, and since that 2013, uh, the green shaded area signifies a record water level rise. The, the water levels have never risen quicker than they did during that 24-month period, culminating in the record highs that we saw across the Great Lakes Basin this, this uh, spring and summer, with Michigan Huron being the only lake not establishing a new record this year, though it came within an inch of doing so this summer. Um, it, it looks like the record for December uh, is, uh, may fall, depending on what types of uh, conditions we see over the next couple of, couple of weeks. So currently, uh, this is a, a chart that's available on our website. And you can see that we track things, again, on a lake-wide basis. Uh, and you can see from the start of the month, Lake Superior has declined. Uh, Michigan Huron has declined slightly. Lake St. Clair has declined, you know, and as expected, though we have seen uh, slower than normal seasonal declines on all of the Great Lakes this year because of the persistent wet conditions uh, that we have had. And then you can see the new records that we established uh, earlier this, this year as well. Um, if, if I could use one slide to to say why our water level is so high, this slide would be it. Uh, the, the Weather Service, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric <laughs> Administration, um, they, they obviously are in charge of tracking the weather and tracking precipitation patterns. Um, and, and they classified the last 12 to 60 months are the wettest or second wettest periods in the Great Lakes region in 120 years. So if the, these uh, red area or red boxes just signify that the, the 60 month period ending November 30th, the 48 month period ending November 30th, 36 month and 24 month being the second, it's just been unbelievably wet across the Great Lakes Basin for the past 60 months and record wet record-setting precipitation at times. You know, and looking at just some of the, the statistics, it's looking like t cities like Green Bay uh, on the west side of the state will set new record precipitation for the year. Um, you know, locally here in Detroit, it, it's been an unbelievably wet several, several years. Uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin is going to set an annual precipitation record for the second year in a row, or already has set it for the second year in a row, and they did that on September 22nd. So they set a record for amount of precip in a year with still three and a half months left to go in the year. And, and that's just indicative of, of the types of weather pattern that, that we've, we've been seeing um, driving these water levels so high. So what's ahead? Uh, we use National Weather Service outlooks to kind of tailor our water level forecasting. We look for signals in their products that might uh, give us an idea of what type of, of conditions to expect so we can adjust our estimates of, and forecasts of net basin supply. So this is the winter outlook released uh, about a month ago now. And, and that, how to interpret these is, is this is a kind of a class forecast where above means above average, 
B means below average, and EC means equal chances. So that means there's a 33.3% chance of it being wet, 33% chance of it being dry, or 33% chance of it being normal. Um, so as you can see in uh, the, the green shaded area, that signifies that at the time, the Weather Service saw a greater chance of wetter conditions in the December, January, February period than either normal or, or drier conditions. That doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It just means that there's a you know, between 40 and 50 percent chance of it being wetter than average and 25 to 30 percent chance of it being normal or below average. Fast forward uh, three more months. This is the spring outlook. Again, released at the same time and the, the same story. Um, a greater chance for above average precipitation this spring with also some chance of below normal temperatures, uh, especially across the, the northern Great Lakes. Uh, so uh, we'll skip past that one. I think it's a repeat. Yep. Um, so just what does that mean in terms of future water levels? So this is another water level report that's available on our website. Uh, how to interpret the, what you're seeing here is the, the red line is the daily mean water level, the blue line, uh, daily mean water level for 2019. The blue line is the daily mean water level for 2018. The hash marks represent the record high and record low water levels for those specific months. The purplish dot is the long-term average. And the green dot is what we call our most probable water level forecast, or our best estimate of water levels over the next six months, considering all of the input that we get from the Weather Service, our own statistical look uh, at what could be coming in the future. And then uh, with that green dot is a vertical red bar, and that is indicative of the uh, what could happen if wetter conditions occur than, than expected or drier conditions occur than expected. So the, the story here is, is that it's looking like 2020 will start higher across all of the lakes than we started in 2019. Um, it, 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 and it, you can see the how flat water levels have been, especially on the upper lakes, d the, during the time of year that they're typically declining. And, and you look at this over the past couple of years, we have seen faster than average water level rises in the spring and slower or lower than normal water level decli declines in the fall. And when that happens year after year, water levels from one year to the next continue to rise, again, culminating in where we are this year. So. Um, to put some numbers on this, uh, January on Lakes Michigan Huron looks to be about 15 inches higher than it was in January of 2019. Um, and on Lake St. Clair, about 11 inches higher uh, in January of 2020 than it was in, in 2019. And then heading into, uh, as we get into the spring again, remaining a, a couple of inches above last year on, on Lake St. Clair. Um, and approaching records uh, again next to spring. Um, and certainly records look to fall on Lakes Michigan and Huron um, in the early part of 2020. Uh, just moving downstream, again, it's the same story on all the lakes. Um, higher in, to start 2020 than, than we started 2019. Um, and certainly record levels are, are within the realm of possibility as we head into uh, the, the spring of, of 2020. Uh, just, you know, something that we've dealt with uh, as water levels have, have returned to the high side of average is ice-related flooding and jamming on the St. Clair River. Uh, this is something that the Corps of Engineers monitors uh, all the time in the winter in co uh, cooperation with the Coast Guard and the Weather Service. Um, typically what happens is we get ice forming in Lake Huron. It uh, flows down the St. Clair River, gets to the delta, and then stops. And then more ice enters the river and more ice is formed. And if enough of it uh, forms in the right spot, it can restrict the flow of water or stop the flow of water which causes the water levels behind that jam to rise very quickly 
and fall very quickly down the downstream side. Um, northerly winds can compound the issue by pushing more water into the, the St. Clair. So we're uh, constantly monitoring this during the ice seasons to help the Coast Guard pinpoint where uh, flushing activities or ice breaking activities need to occur. Uh, we use uh, these water level, these are a series of water level gauges that are located on the St. Clair River, both in the United States and Canada. And these are really uh, what we use along with, you know, eyes on the ground, Intel 2, uh, windshield tours. Uh, Coast Guard flights to kind of get a handle on the ice situation, but we use these water level gauges to tell us where uh, ice jam issues might be occurring. So uh, as we move down the system, the, the water levels at these gauges fluctuate kind of in, in tandem with one another during the ice free season. But when we get into ice in the river, we can see the hydrographs uh, look very different. So this is the the 1987 ice jam event. These are the water level gauges uh, that were shown on the previous slide. And what we look for is divergence from one gauge to the next. So uh, typically the, the gauges all react together. When we get ice in the river, one, the, the gauge upstream will rise, the gauge downstream will decline. And that's a uh, uh, an indication that there's ice, uh, an ice restriction between those two gauges. So there are several examples of this um, on the slide, I don't know if the laser pointer will reach that far, um, but uh, the, the purple line there is the gauge at uh, St. Clair State Police. The next downstream gauge, the brown one, is Port Lambton on the Canadian side, and you can see a very large divergence between those two gauges around the middle of the month. And those are the things that we look for throughout the ice months to help pinpoint areas where uh, ice breaking needs to occur, or flushing operations. Um, need to happen. Uh, just some quick takeaways again. Uh, water levels to start 2020 higher than they started 2019. Um, some higher peaks are certainly possible this year if we continue to see these very wet conditions in the winter uh, and the spring. Um, the primary driver of these water level fluctuations are the changing weather patterns. And uh, regulation of outflows, there are two places on the, on the, on the Great Lakes where outflows are, are managed by international uh, agreements. Um, St. Mary's River from Lake Superior into Lakes Michigan-Huron, that outflow is regulated. And the outflow from Lake Ontario into the St. Lawrence River uh, is regulated as well. The important thing about that one is because of the influence of Niagara Falls, there's no influence of what they do on St. Lawrence River that doesn't impact anything but Lake Ontario because Lake Ontario sits some 300 feet below the level of Lake Erie. Um, and then the, the St. Mary's River, um, because of the sheer size and scale of the system, I mean, we're talking about the world's largest freshwater system, there's just not the ability to use outflow regulation to fully regulate lake levels. And we can't use regulation to prevent extreme highs or lows, especially when we have these repeated instances of record precipitation across the Great Lakes. Hey, hey Keith, can I, how, how much, say, in inches or a foot, could are these restrictions or, or the gates affect us? Um, so we, we, it's a very popular question, so I'm sure. I'll, I'll use the month of May as an example. Um, and it's kind of uh, what we looked at. So if we look at the amount of water that's flowing from Lake Superior to Lakes Michigan here on in the month of May, just that outflow, it accounted for about two inches of water on Lakes Michigan here on. That net basin supply, that precip runoff and evaporation accounted for 13 inches of water on Lakes Michigan and Huron. And then if you look at an individual water level gauge on Lakes Michigan and Huron, I'll pick Holland, Michigan, for example. There's a water level gauge there. The, the, uh, the wind or a storm event can cause that water level gauge to rise another 24 inches. So that, right. that it, it's just not on the same scale as what the net basin supply or what an individual storm event can do. So, so you're saying two inches on Lake here in Lake Michigan, how would that affect us down here? Um, and even less than that. Less. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank um, you. Yep. So it just you know those takeaways there, and then finally, um, there's my phone number and email. Um, if you have questions about something I said, uh, need an interpretation, please give me a call. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you. That's our high water website as well. Uh, you can get to all of our water level information, all of our forecasts, all of our data reports. Uh, there's some uh, FYI videos on there um, and in information on our regulatory permitting and emergency resp response. And then um, that's the end of uh, my slides, Justin. I don't know how yeah. we're going to. And we've also <laughs> linked Keith's site, the high water site, to the Be Ready stclaircounty.org site, and that's also linked on the top of the St. Clair County uh, website as well. So uh, you feel free at any time to get to that uh, and get any information you need for not only the Army Corps' uh, flooding information as well as our uh, emergency management information for flooding. So, okay, I Jim. Think is it possible to post this uh, slide presentation on that site as well? So we can access it later. Um, uh, yes. Uh, because of the forecast information, um, I might take that forecast information out because after a while it does get old. But there are some very good uh, things that, that we've been talking about now you know, for several months that, yes, we can certainly put some slides. Or shoot me an email, and I'll shoot them over to you. Yes, uh, that's a great idea. Yep. Justin, there's, there's a question, question there. there. I love the, I love the presentation. Thank you. But one final question, and I'd like to put it to all of you, these fellows that are really looking at this stuff. Very simple for us. Coming into next year, full year, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most confident that you are that we will attain water levels equal to what we had last year. Can you give me your number? Um, I, I can't because there, there, there's no way to accurately predict what the weather is going to be next week, let alone in, in the, the, the months that follow. And that's the primary driver. Sure. Sure. Right. I'll I'll focus on those green dots of, of our forecast, and our, our forecast only extends out until May. We don't have a forecast that goes beyond that. So that that green dot is our most probable. That's the forecast that we have the most confidence in, and that water level by the time we get to May is uh, based on the numbers two inches lower than it was in May of 2019. But again, there's the range there as well. So that has to be considered. Are, are, we're doing more Nancy. questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to ask you about the With all due respect to Keith and your report, which is wonderful, there's something that's not coming into it. And I have to tell you my experience. 35 years ago, Thank you. 
he had was a 30-year employee of the Corps of Engineers. And he's been filling me in on some of this stuff, and I'm not, you know, an expert on any of this water situation. However, one area that we have not talked about, that we must talk about, are the freighters and the winter shipping. And the, the cost of the freighters and what they can add to cargo when the water level rises one inch. And it's all about money. If the water is partially controlled, I'm not saying that it isn't, but I don't want to speak out here because I'm not an expert. But when you're talking such big money, commerce is terrific today, and we're all happy about that. But I wrote to the IJC and said, we need to have fair play here. You know, the, the precipitation, evaporation, all of that does play in. But when we didn't have water shipping, the natural flow of the water would reduce, be down, and then in the spring it would rise again. And so I'm just throwing that out that I think that this is, the actual reports on the water are not the entire story. I have some uh, papers here that you can contact the, the um, coalition yourself. They have a questionnaire they'd like you to fill out about how much money you spent during um, taking care of your uh, property this spring or this fall. And also the address of the IJC. And they they need to look at this. We are the people. And I think that we the people are having our rights violated. Yeah. And, uh, and so we need to talk about fair play. I love the commerce system. Any truth to uh, I, I mean, like that that, that I, initial foot drop in depth that one time was something released a, a great amount of water or is that just natural? Well, in the the meteorological conditions that led to the record high water levels of 85, 86, and early 87 are very similar to what they were now, and then water levels did drop off remarkably after that. 1988 is the drought of record across the, the Great Lakes Basin. So um, I, I can say with confidence that there's, well, there was not a plug pulled. There, there, was, there was not a, um, but you know, the, again, I, I will stick to the talking point, stick because it's fact that the primary drivers of these water level fluctuations are the weather. And the, the, the more rain and snow we get in repeated years, the higher the water levels are, are going to go. And there's very minimal uh, effect that any sort of regulation activity with outflows can have in compared to that uh, meteorological influence. So we had a record drought in 87. Dropped 88 the water, was the drought of record. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. One thing that I would like to see added to this presentation is just one slide showing the Great Lakes watershed limits. One thing you have to realize is it's well and good to look at the continental patterns of temperature and rainfall of precipitation, but virtually the entire upper lakes basin is controlled by the rainfall in Michigan. Southwestern Ontario, that little comma-shaped piece that sticks down toward Windsor. The rest of the country contributes, both either country, but outside of the Great Lakes watershed limits, contributes nothing to our water levels. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have slides that show the the extents of the Great Lakes Basin and, and have used those in the past, and we can. Superior, right. It's. 
it's a unique system in many ways. I mean, if, if you look at the, the, the Lake Superior Basin itself, the lake makes up most of its basin. There's very minimal land uh, in the, the Lake Superior Basin itself. And, and as you, you know, depending on the lake, that statistic's a little bit different. But, uh, you know, we're, we're tasked with monitoring those conditions over the entire Great Lakes Basin to include over the lake in the United States and Canada as well. So. All right. If, if there's no more questions, I'll, I'll move on to, to my presentation. So back on October, yes, sir. We're dedicated 45 minutes to this first agenda topic. It's five minutes from that time frame. Will this be a five minute presentation? So I'll get through it as quickly as possible. All right. All right. So, I'm sorry. So I'm Justin Westmiller, the director for Homeland Security and Emergency Management. So, on October 18th, the my staff met with the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Coast Guard, Canadian Coast Guard, all seven emergency managers throughout southeastern Michigan, as well as the National Weather Service. And uh, who else do we have in the room? That was about it, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty close. And we had a meeting to talk about uh, what, yeah, Canadian Coast Guard, what's uh, probably most important in this room and what we just talked about, what Keith just talked about is uh, ice jamming in the river for winter flooding, uh, potential for winter flooding due to the high water levels going into the winter time. Uh, and, and what actions are potentially available should we have any sort of ice damming and things like that. So, um, so we have information available that tells us that Lake St. Clair, and this was, this was information we had um, a, a, few, you know, a few weeks ago, and I think Keith said it already, we're already going in to 2020 knowing that Lake St. Clair, I think you just said, what, it's 11 inches higher? Is that what mm -hmm. you just said? So it's higher even now than it was a few weeks ago. So I'll update the slide. But uh, it's 11 inches higher than it was in 2019 uh, right now. So, um, so we know that there's a high potential for our water level to be higher in 2020 uh, as we get into spring and summer than than it is than it was in 2019 when we set records uh, in a couple of different months. I think in in June and July or July and August. So my office is responsible to work with all of our communities, all of our residents and communities, to make sure that we are prepared to uh, to take action together to make sure that everybody is safe and and can can be safe throughout that period and so we're working through that but uh, in the winter time we want to make sure that should we get that that flash situation where we get a notification of the river jamming in a certain area what actions can be taken can we get the coast guard on the line to come through and and break up that jam and the way that works is my office notifies the army corps of engineers this gentleman right here and his staff and they in turn take a look at things with keith and say yep there is an ice jam somewhere and they turn around and notify the coast guard command center in cleveland or the coast guard command center in detroit and they will find the nearest coast guard cutter and and start working that we do have we do know that there is going to be some some winter shipping traffic moving which helps us because every time a ship moves through it actually breaks the ice for us right so as long as we can keep that traffic moving through the system uh it actually will will help keep the keep the water open and keep things moving so that's good news for us um but what we know is we have two Coast Guard cutters, two U.S. Coast Guard cutters, and two Canadian Coast Guard cutters that are in Operation Coal Shovel at all times. The Hollyhock is available, but it has a limited ice breaking capability. Uh, unlike the Bramble of old days, it's not as good as the Bramble in breaking ice. It is ice capable, but it has a big square rear end, 
and it, it struggles to back up in the ice uh, because ice sometimes jams in the rudder and things like that. So, um, so they have four icebreakers available anytime in our area in Operation Coal Shovel. Uh, and in times of heavy ice, they'll call them Aconayan, okay? So, so that's what we know. I included a slide here. This is a pretty important slide to show you uh, as you see trending from 1900, and the Weather Service provided this slide for us on December 3rd, as you see trending from 1900 to 2020, uh, we are at an all-time high for precipitation over a 60-month period. Uh, so that is one of the reasons we are at such a high water level. Uh, 1986 there is obviously the, the second highest peak, uh, and then we fall off to the, the very median at 156.0, but, but we are at an all-time high right now, uh, right up there at 194 or 184. My eyes are not as good as they used to be. So, uh, so that was provided for us just kind of as a visual to let everybody know why our groundwater is so saturated right now. And then I think this thing's not picking up very well. So fall weather pattern, Keith talked about this a little bit too, but third wettest on record for Michigan for September, October, November. So we are holding a lot of water in the ground throughout the state of Michigan, and obviously that gets into the watershed. Uh, and we are holding a lot of water heading into winter. And so as we get into next spring, that absorption uh, will be lo much lower going into the spring, and that will enter the waterways. So from everywhere, all the snowpack, everything running into the waterway, that's going to just continue to add to our, our problems, OK? And that's important for us because of, because of everything Keith is talking about. Which is why we're here. It, it, absolutely. And, and that's why we're, we're talking about what we're talking about today. Winter snowpack, so the, the Weather Service uh, talked a lot about this to us. As of December 3rd, there were already a couple of feet of snow on the ground in the upper Great Lakes, all right? So, uh, and what we do know is on December 15th, two of, the, two of the icebreakers up in Lake Superior were already breaking ice, okay? So that cuts down on evaporation for us already up in Lake Superior which Keith will tell you uh, doesn't, is not helpful in the evaporation portion of, uh, of our needs. So, um, so we are just, we are continuing to plan and understand that, that the, the odds are stacking up against us, not for us, for us to, to, to be potentially in for another high water situation, all right? So we need to make sure that our communities and our residents are working for and planning for another high water season. And that's why I'm, I've been making the rounds throughout the county and talking to as many people as possible to make sure that one, you have your personal plans ready, okay? Two, you have if you don't already have flood insurance and, and you're in an area where you can get flood insurance, please think about it, okay? I'm not telling you that you must do it or anything like that. That is a personal decision, but, but please think about it if it's, if it's something that may interest you because it's a, it's a way to protect your home. It's a way to protect your property, all right? Also remember that flood insurance doesn't protect the goods inside your house. You need to talk to your provider on that uh, to get a rider to do that. But, but these are all options and ways to protect your property, all right? Um, and so we wanna get that word out. <clears throat> also, as we, as we as a community start working through this and things like sandbags and other, other protective equipment become available, Protect your home. Uh, there's no way to, to, to do things like put sandbags on your break wall and think that's going to work because three doors down or four doors down, 
the water's gonna come around the break wall anyway, and you're still gonna flood out potentially if you don't protect your home, okay? It's all about your home. Um, yes, sir. So, so let's talk about that in the next, it, let's, let's push all that to the next round, okay? We'll, 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 we'll work all that next. Yes, sir. <clears throat> And we don't think you're crazy. No. Right. Yes, sir. I, I, I got yelled at, at my by my dad about three times about that. So I'm 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 with you fully on that. So yes, sir. We're, for the sake of time, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, are you Brace in Clay Township? Um, last year, we tried to get a temporary no wake in the, all the channels. And the governor told us, well, to do that, we have to have be in a state of emergency. August 12th, the county sent a letter to the governor requesting a state of emergency. It was pretty much ignored to what, the end of October? And then it was denied. And the DNR does not have the juice to do a temporary no wake uh, order on, on our rivers. They can do a permanent one after some public hearings and things. So actually, I've been in contact with several legislators. Gary Eisen has been helpful. Um, we're trying to put together some legislation that will actually give the DNR, take it out of the governor's hand because she's ignoring us, Put, get, get some legislation so that I can request the DNR say, hey, we got problems here. We need a temporary no wake. And uh, I'm going to be testifying in the subcommittee for the DNR in January about getting this passed. And hopefully we'll have the juice this year to, to get that done. And let, let me ask, tell you, too, I was working very hard. I know it was frustrating. I was calling Pat. Pat, they're, they're dredging. The Corps of Engineers is dredging all the sand and the, the South Channel and head of Russell Island. We need that sand. Well, they can't do it. We couldn't do it until the emergency, state of emergency was signed. You know, I, want, I was looking at trying to get 10,000 yards dumped on, on Harsons Island, another lo big load dumped on Russell Island, and another load actually on the mainland for people to use to protect their homes. And, you know, they, they kept on referring to, oh, it's the core sand, this, that. I, yes, it's the taxpayer's sand. And uh, it, was, it, it, it didn't work, and I, truthfully, I'm blaming the governor that didn't sign that state of emergency where it would make, we could pull some strings and make that available and, and give that sand back to the citizens. So, Artie, I have a question for you on that. So, I get it, you're, you're gonna play the political game, right? And here we are, we, I mean, you just said, we know it's coming, it's just resolving the <clears throat> So, we start with the political governor thing and legislation and all that, and there's people sitting on this board right now that, you know, hopefully are doing that. But voters need to be educated as that's part of it, is education and enforcement. Right, and that's what it is, so enforcement. So I know that's, you know, that's a whole other thing, it's budget. I'm going to be talking to, I'm going to be talking to that, to the DNR too. Why should, most of these people are violating, don't live here. They're from Oakland, Macomb County, wherever, passing through, going up north. Why should our taxpayers be, have the burden of enforcing a state rule that the people are violating don't even live here. And I'm gonna put that to them and ask for more money from the state for, for uh, enforcement. Why should we have the burden 
of paying for the enforcement on someone else's rule and someone else is breaking the law. But we're the ones getting the damage of, of the property. I can almost give you the time. Oh, I'm sure you can. When, but I like to get... When the control should be there. Because, you know, everybody gets hungry at five. Oh, yeah. But I've always said, put a, <laughs> I got put a control boat in front of Browns. Oh, oh yeah. Right, at 4.30. Right. right. Put all put five control boats. Yep. Because everybody behaves and they're all good and they sit on their hands and they close down. I think they bring you. It's all they bring you. Yep. It's all right. They don't wait until they're there. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a no wake zone out already there. And they don't care. They just blow right by. My right. We know. I got holes ripped in my barge from my spuds ripping because a guy comes by with a 42 foot yep. 50 feet off my dock. Yep. I mean, come on. Yep. The police show up on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, why not? I, I tell them all the time to park right in my docks. I don't care. Yeah. There's a cut right across from Brown right. right next to my house. Park there. Then watch all these guys go by. I mean, you know, yep. it, it's ridiculous. And I've, I've stopped them. I came countless times and asked them about this. And it, it's, we all, you know, we're trying, we're trying, we're out here. No, they're not. We need more money and resources for enforcement. I would like to know why there aren't more resources. The state of Michigan collects registration fees. That's right. And other revenues that come from all of, all of us and those why is the state of Michigan, and perhaps uh, Senator Rowers can help us with this, why are they not sending some of that revenue to this municipality so that you can have 10 votes out there, whether they have deputies or whomever? I get tired of sitting over there on that island for four days, getting washed out, and then on Sunday night, here comes the sheriff as the sun's going down. It does us no good. It's not an allocation of resources. It's adequate for our situation. Yeah. It needs to be addressed. And those revenues need to be reallocated. Right. If I could give you a brief synopsis of what we tried to do. One question. In encompassing all this, Artie, you said the uh, a key situation is to have an emergency situation, an emergency uh, enactment by the governor. Correct. And we weren't asking for money. We were just asking for making resources available. Right, right. So one of the things that we could do as individuals, right, is write a letter to the governor, right, asking for that authorization. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, if, I'd, like to, I'd like to also mention that when you write one letter, your representative takes that letter and, and justifies it for 10,000 people. One letter for 10,000, because if you thought about it, you took the time to write it, they consider that for the voice for 10,000 people. We are a community here. Clay Township is a water community. The, it's not these, these educated people that are in office against us, and we're against them because that's what it feels like here. These educated people are here to help all of us. And guess what? I agree with what, what you say about the voters, but those voters, the 45-footer, is probably logging 600 gallons of fuel that he bought at Sassy Marina, he bought on the island, he bought here, and they're funneling all our marinas and restaurants. They're feeding it back into the community. Because we go from If I could give you a, an let's, let's, let's give it. We're, we're not the we're not gonna get DNR. close to our timeline of getting through things. If we if if we could take the, the, the problem of wakes and set it aside because it's something we have been working on, we know it's an issue, and we're gonna continue to work on that. Uh, the DNR has a, has comment on it. if we could do get that comment and, and then get back going through things yeah. so we make sure we get time for everything here. But but if what I guess stuff. what I would ask, and I know everybody, you know, it it, it helps to to get it out. 
but once we get an issue, let's try as best we can to get that issue down. You know, I've got it down to find out where the money's going, and, and I've worked with the sheriff already on this for years, trying to find a way to get a fund for Marine Patrol. It doesn't exist in the state. Um, you know, but we'll, we'll try to try to mark these issues off and, and deal with them so we, we can, you know, get through as many issues as we possibly can. So, sorry, sir. Um, you're good. I'm uh, Ben Lasher. I'm a conservation officer here in St. Clair County. I apologize for being late. I had a pre previous engagement. Um, my sergeant here, uh, Sergeant Mayor, is new to the area, so he doesn't have the information that I've had working here in the last 14 years. Our department directed patrols from noon to 8 o'clock, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. We pulled officers. There's only three officers in St. Clair County. We pulled officers from all of Southeast Michigan to work these patrols from noon to 8. We did our best to provide coverage. We Two men on one boat. Uh, and we're patrolling the flats area. So working with the Sheriff's Department, trying to address the Solano Wake violations. We wrote tickets to people from the area. We wrote pe tickets to people from all Southeast Michigan for the most part. Um, we've tried our darndest to address the problems as they are. We understand there's problems. Um, but again, we have two to three officers per county. We sent officers from, I worked with these patrols, officers from Wayne County, officers from Monroe County, officers from Oakland County, officers from Genesee County. We're pulling officers from the whole district in Southeast Michigan to address the issue you have here in Clay Township. Um, I understand the damage. I understand. I have family members that have property in the river. I understand it. Um, our resources are limited to what our budget allows us to do. Um, well, I don't disagree with you. I, I'm at the bottom of the hill. It all rolls down to me. So I, I'm doing my best to, to address the issues. Um, and, but that's where we are with the DNR and our resources that are available. We only have so many officers per county, and we only have so, much out, so many hours in our budget to address for marine violations. They, so, I'm not trying to push blame on just you guys, but there's a whole bunch of you know, people that could be coming into this. And they're not, the areas that are really getting pounded are the ones that are getting pounded. And that's what we're talking about. And I just don't understand. I mean, you know, it costs a lot of money to live out there. And my yard was flooded four sides of my house. I'm dealing with that. And then I got to watch these boaters come by. And then, like I said, you know, the sheriff department will come by at Tuesday at 7. Really? Why don't well, we have the, the, the sheriff's department is in a similar situation. They have one boat per area, so they generally may have one boat at the north end, one end at the south end. So yeah, we we got the we got the no wake issue on the table. We will continue to work and address it. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not resolved already, but but we we got to move on from this issue to the other issues. So Justin, yep. if you could. Yep. So uh, we will get. We will get to all the questions. Let, let's just let me let me finish my presentation. This is the last slide, and then we'll we'll let Dr. Mercantant talk for just a second, and then uh, and then we'll keep going. Okay, I, we could we could do this all day long, and I know that. So we just want to make sure. All right, all right. So just to wrap it up, um, and I know you have more slides in your in your handout and that's great that's just informational i just want to make sure that that this is just kind of the wrap up okay so at the end of the day uh high lake water obviously means that that we expect that there's a, a high potential for ice jam especially uh knowing that that we're at a higher water level than normal right now um so we're gonna along with with pat and keith's team we are we are keeping an extremely tight watch on it throughout the winter time this year, uh, just like we were last year, and uh, and we will be very responsive to that. That doesn't mean the moment we see something happen, you're going to see an a, a icebreaker scream in there and break it, right? Because they could be up in Taos or up near St. Ignace, and it could take them an eight to ten hour transit to get down. Uh, so just know that that we will be very uh, we will communicate as as much as possible we will let everybody know what's going on when we notice something is wrong and and we will work with the township leadership with 
uh, the community leadership because I think uh, we're building some really good community uh, communications capabilities, uh, both with island residents and with township residents, as well as uh, with Artie and his staff. We've, we've got that uh, working really well now. And so we will be, we will be communicating very well with people uh, should any sort of emergency or situation arise. So um, as the Weather Service puts, record or near record water levels for spring and summer 2020 on all the Great Lakes is a, is a high potential. And so we're just gonna keep an eye on that, okay? That's all I have. Um, is when this meeting is over for any flooding or any uh, homeland security and emergency management questions, I will stay as long as you guys want to talk. So I'll be in the back of the room, in the front of the room, wherever you want to chat, okay? So please come and find me, all right? Uh, I'd like to turn it over, ma'am, oh, doctor, it's hi. you. Good morning. I'm Dr. Annette Mercatant. I'm the medical health officer of the county. Um, of course, our job is to promote and protect the health of the community. So our initial and ongoing uh, concerns will be a lot with your septic systems. And what I'd like to really encourage all of you is to contact us early and often so that we can assist you uh, with this process. You know, an order to vacate is an extremely rare public health um, uh, thing to do. And, and it would not be anything that would just be sprung on any of the citizens. We've worked uh, very diligently with all of you. So again, I just want to say make sure you reach out if you have concerns or even um, ways of mitigating uh, a septic failure. It would be a really important thing for you to consider. That's all I have to say. Well, and, and the reason I, I wanted to make sure that uh, Dr. Bergkant was here today was because um, at one point, and, and I'll have to rely on some of you gentlemen to help me um, make sure this is accurate, I was told that at our high water mark this spring or summer, that four inches higher, half of Clay Township would be underwater. And there's been predictions of 11 to 12 inches higher. So, um, and that's really what prompted me to want to have this meeting is that if, if on your property we were 12 inches higher than the high point of last year, what mm -hmm. is your plan for your property? For septic failure, well failure, possibly once you have septic failure, you can have that. Um, and then the first floor, do you have a second floor? So can you get, can you get your property up, you know, if, if you're gonna be in, in water in your home, uh, can you get your property up? So first, let, let's get accuracy on that. I don't wanna cause any uh, con concern or alarm beyond what, what the actual facts are. So Senator, the, the 11 inches is the start of the year. The, the forecasted water level for January of 2020 right now is forecasted to be 11 inches higher than it was in January of 2019. Not an indication of 11 inches higher at the peak. Okay, so the only way we would see 11 higher at the peak was be as we had the exact same kind of flow through we had last Correct. year. Correct, if, if we, we've done some simulations that if we, if we saw a repeat of 2019 and 2020, then yes, that would lead to significantly higher water levels at the peak next year. All right. So that it's it's important because, um, and maybe we can get Justin if you've got any experience in this. If you get that kind of water level, um, your septic field, your septic tank can actually start to float. Um, can we? Do we have anyone that can address that? We have Steve in the back. Yeah, Steve, he's uh, our environmental health director at the health department. Yeah. Want to speak to our experiences yeah, uh, recently. We recommend that as individuals like next spring, it looks like it's going to be a real peak eye to have contingency plans and make other living arrangements during that time period. That's going to be a multitude of issues with homes dealing with the high water levels. We're not bringing birds in. Yeah, it's to help. So, uh, so, I think we'll talk about dirt, right? But, but dirt doesn't help your septic field, okay? It just doesn't. Um, so when, and, and Steve, what is the depth of septic fields on the island? Um, like most of them are elevated, but they're, you know, 12 to 18 inches below the, the ground. So, and what, but I think that elevation is, is um, if I remember correctly, it is. Uh, uh, 578.5. Right. 
And so when we get near 578.0 or so, they start to fail, right? That's fair to say. And you'll notice that inside the house. Correct. And that becomes that becomes a serious situation, all right? For a lot of reasons. And 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 that's what that's what begins to start that becomes an issue that, that needs to be dealt with, right? And so so we start coming up with plans, right? That's not anybody ordering anybody out or anything like that. That's where my staff and Doc's staff starts asking questions on, can we help you? Not, we're pushing you out. It's, do you need help? And if so, can we help you? Is there anything we can do for you? Is there, is there services we can help you either find or is there people we can we can work with you right yes sir absolutely So we don't have road commission here today, and, and I apologize for that. That that was just a piece we missed today. And so um, what I can do is we can we can probably get a hold of the the road commission director Kirk Weston and follow up with you on that. But what I will tell you is they did a pretty good job of building those roads up uh, later on in the fall. It took a little while uh, to do that, and here's why. It, it, in the summertime, once they were flooded out and they started to wash away, it, they, they were going to continue to wash away no matter how much road grade we put on it, right, throughout the summer, because that water was continuing to pour in. I'm sorry? I was wondering if they were going to do something. Right, and so we did that. This is what I was getting to is we did that on um, Anchor Bay Drive, right? Yeah. We built that roadway way up. There was a couple of other roadways in Ira Township that we built way up as well because those residents lost access to their road. We, um, yeah, we built up the primary roads. Right. Uh, there were some gravel roads where really not too many people lived on. You know, Correct. They, we had to close them. Right. Um, you know, and, and going forward, you know, yeah, I have concern on, on certain roads on the island and everything. I have a concern about Dyke Road. Yeah. We get six inches, Very that's much. underwater. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and I mean, it's, it's going to be a serious problem, no doubt. And uh, we, we do have uh, plans in, in put in place and everything. And this goes back again to the uh, state of emergency that was denied. If we had that, we would have resources available from the Corps of Engineers and other groups to help us build these roads up. So I think we got let, let's Let's continue the no wake meeting after right. this. I'll stick around too. So yeah. let's press on. All right, and I, and I think, Senator, we're we're good for our portion. So, I will can I, turn. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so, what happened to us and everybody in the room last year is we kept fighting water management. Uh, it wasn't a state of emergency. We didn't know how high it was going to go. Uh, we spent money in April. We spent money out of our pocket in May, June. Is there any way to get that money from the state back? So if you put in $40,000 worth of seawall caps, bladders, berms, that we can get paid after the fact? First question, that's money. Second question is, how do we get paid to build what we have to, to basically turn into Denmark and put moats around all of our so, so the answer to your first question is, unless it's a presidential state of emergency, right, under the Stafford Act, there is no, absolutely no 
uh, funding for uh, private property, none, zero, okay? The state won't pay any money ever. There is no state law or state uh, public act that provides state funding for private property. There just isn't, all right? And under the Stafford Act, uh, through FEMA, they provide zero percent and low interest loans under the Small Business uh, uh, Authority or SBA for homeowners. That's how that works. And then they do grants and other things. But, uh, but the state will never provide funding for private property uh, under a state of emergency, even if the governor signed a state of emergency. Okay? That, that's just not a thing. One, so One thing we probably should share with, because Carrie's here, um, is that everybody was spending money on their own property. The county was spending a tremendous amount of mo money right. at that time, too, yep. uh, with oh. water mitigation. So, Carrie, do you have any of that information about what the county is spending? It, it's okay. almost $2.1 million. At one point, down here. we had several, several pumps running. Um, and, and that's part of what we were applying to the state for is to try and get uh, try to get help with that as a county too and, and, and we got the no right um, they, they spent uh, t over two million dollars the township spent about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the infrastructure this and, past and when year. I say that that's that's countywide including all of our communities and that that includes manpower uh, that doesn't include losses countywide right so we didn't include that ma'am community, if we were able to get the plugs that go in the drains that have the features, sure, I could buy two of them for about 2500 bucks, but I would actually have to buy more like probably six to protect from Bar Harbor to St. Clair Street. If we could do that, then we wouldn't be fighting so hard all the time to restructure the ditches, to keep the dirt there. We, we do have some there. plans. To, for to do just that okay. so let's 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 move on right let's move yeah. on again we can so what i'll say is so that we can get to senator lauer's part on the on the auto ferry and all those issues i will i, I will talk all day long if we need to on flooding issues and and i will help everybody uh, understand all those okay can we unless because i got one there one there one here yeah. Okay. All right. I think we have to. Yep. Interest in the interest time. I think we we need to move on. You know, to talk about the about the ferry and status there. Um, that's you know. Please use the light. I, yeah, we are. I am. We are using it. <laughs> they don't. Work. I'll just chalk louder. It it doesn't seem to be working that well. Um, so let's let's move into the air, issue of the of the ferry and and really. Um, you know, this issue really became a, a hot topic when, when, of course, the increase in the, in the fares were announced. Um, you know, that, that started certainly a number of calls to my office. Um, and then in addition to that, when the, when the ferry failed last week, when the dock fell in, you know, of course, that, that even increased the calls further. So what I would hope to do is to move through um, a discussion about what are your options, right? So, you know, we have, we have one main way to the island right now, and, and that's Champion Auto Ferry. As long as that's always the case, um, as residents, you're gonna have a, a real keen interest in, in, in that ferry and how it operates. Um, the ferry is privately held. Um, at one time, there were several ferries. You know, now, we, now we have one ferry, and um, I've had a lot of suggestions, you know, over the over the last uh, week or two, of you know we should just take that thing over. Um, well, that's that's kind of what it amounts to, or the state should take it over, or anything like that. Um, and and just so we don't waste a lot of time um, thinking about those things, I just want to let you know that you know uh, private property is is pretty important. Uh, principle in this country and so when you when you talk about taking something over you got to you got to make sure that that uh, um, you're going to consider all the ramifications of that and and how that would go about and the fact that the person that owns the private property would be a certainly a very integral part of that discussion um, 
because it, you know this the state you know I, I if if you can take over a, a, a private property they can the state can take over your private property so um, just let's let's just you know I would just want to get that out up front because of some of the some of the suggestions that have been made were along that line so um, so there's a couple of ways to, to break this down I'm hoping you know one is what are the alternatives for for that and we can talk about uh, what the state does with other other Beaver Island's a good example uh, Beaver Island has a similar situation one ferry um, really struggling to stay in service uh, even with cost share uh, the residents of Beaver, Beaver Island got together formed a cooperative um, formed a board purchased the ferry hired the the ferry owners to operate it under contract and they're getting 60 percent cost share from the Department of Transportation um, and just so you know those the, we had we had looked at that in the past um, probably f six years ago 13 yeah yeah and then height has kind of gotten so, in our way so we did look at that option and it did it didn't work out at that time could couldn't find a way to quite make that work out at that time so there's there's one option to consider and again all these you know and we got the owners sitting here so um, you know all these kind of things are something that you we would have to or you would have to work through uh, with the owners of course to do something like that um, maybe that's a possibility that is what most of the ferries in the state are doing most of the ferries in the state are getting 50 percent cost share on their operations um, pretty, pretty good deal so that uh, uh, with far less volume than Harsons Island yeah yeah, and usually higher rates too. But and and, and, and well, well, yeah, I've got them too. You know, I can I ask a couple questions on the bill that I'm not clear on. Yep. Um, comparable carriers. How 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 does that fit? How, how do we figure out what's a comparable carrier? Well, and, and I wish I wish we had a, uh, Michigan State Police here. Yes. Here? The governor told them they couldn't come. I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I enacted the bill, but but and and you have a copy of the letter I sent, and that was pretty well ignored too. So. So um, the governor ignores our voice, but then tells MSP directly to this meeting. Yes. Yes. Yep. We got that call yesterday. Hey, Dan, what can Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So let's let's go through that background um, so the the ferry has been an issue uh, before of course I came to office as a state rep um, I would you know hear about it see it see it in the papers and things like that and after I after I began to serve I started looking at the issue uh, working out that's why originally we looked at can we can we move it to a transportation authority create some other system try to find a way because every time the ferry rate was up for an increase it was a big fight between the state um, any owners um, well so there's there's the comment that is good all right now I, I checks and balances but it's a private business and I understand it's a little different because it's the only one okay I know that but you can have the only party store and the only bar and the That's only true. lots of things I, I understand, but there's nothing. Well, I didn't. I didn't. What I what I took. Okay. Okay. Let's. Let, if 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 I can help. Um, get get through that quicker. I'll I'll tell you what the results were. So. When the ferries regulation was moved to the Michigan Public Service Commission, okay, we, I, I met here in here in Clay Township with the Michigan Public Service Commission and the ferry owners several times on those issues. How do we make this system work? You didn't meet with us. Well, no, I didn't. Yeah, I met with the know. owners and the regulated regulative body that was taking care of them. Okay, Not this was. They were also taking care of us. That's a big difference. So during those conversations, at one point, the Michigan Public Service Commission said, it's our job to make sure you don't make any money. That's what they told the owners. The, the 
The Michigan Public Service Commission's job was to, was stated goal was to make sure they didn't make any money. Okay. I, now listen, folks. I am the chair of the Energy Committee. I work with the Michigan Public Service Commission more than anything else in Lansing, and that is their that's their normal role. Okay. Normally, they're in, in we call it a utility. You know, but but the ferry's really not a utility. A utility is is you, you you know how the utility system works. You have it in your power plants. That's a utility. Okay, your phone's not a utility, right? There's a difference. That was deregulated, so there's the differences between the two. When we moved the when the the, the uh, governor signed an executive order, and that was not anything I had to do with it, but they signed an executive order to move the ferry regulation from the Michigan Public Service Commission to the Michigan State Police under the, Fair, under the Water Carriers Act and put the regulation there to help streamline some of the um, confusion, I guess, or, the, or the, the situation they had over ferry increases. Am I talking loud enough in the back? Um, when that happened, 14 staff people moved from the Michigan Public Service Commission to the Michigan State Police, the 14 people in the state that were regulating the Champion Auto Ferry. That's. I think it's terrible. I think it's horrible, but that's how much effort was in the state going into regulating one ferry. I mean, I've seen the, I've seen the financial documents, and the questions asked about you know why why did you spend money on this and why did you spend money on that? I was a private business owner, okay. I can't imagine trying to run a successful business when you got 14 state regulators asking questions, second guessing every every move you make and every decision you make. So that's that's where that legislation came from was trying to find a way to simplify and, and get a straightforward yes or no on on the question of raising a, a rate or not. Now, as a business owner, as any kind of an owner, as a homeowner. Is it easier to take care of your property or harder to take care of your property if you have to have the permission of the of the government to tell you whether or not you can have the income to do so? Well, I, it, the only the only thing that's different about this situation is we got one ferry in one way. Okay, everything else is the same. Okay. You know, we can. All right, let's let's put that down as an issue and look at antitrust. Let's let's put that down as an issue and look at the possibility. Okay. Pardon? I didn't hear that one. Table. All right, I want to I want to try as best we can to set the argument aside of whether the rate is fair or whether the rate is affordable. Well, okay, but I I can't decide that. I'm not in a position to decide that. No, I didn't set it up so you couldn't challenge it. But, all right, all right. If we're gonna if we're gonna make use of time, what I'm trying to find is is options for solutions, okay? If we want to argue about it, we're, we're not going to have the time to get through the, and identify those options for solutions, okay? All, 
All I'm saying, all I'm saying is, I, as your state senator, am not going to be the guy who decides where that that rate is affordable or fair. I don't have the the cap capability to do that. I wouldn't want the capability to do that. So, so, so. Can we? Yeah, yeah. In just one second, okay. Again, I just want to remind you that if we're going to make productive use of our time, I hope we can make use of that time to identify potential solutions to the situation. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for being here today sure. and enlightening us about our high water levels that we know about, we've experienced, and we know how dangerous it is in the future. Thank you, um, St. Clair County, for letting us know how bad it really is going to be. Our question here is, what are we going to do with it? I appreciate everybody writing letters, calling, email our constituents in Lansing and also here in Clay Township. My suggestion is that we hire an attorney and do proceed with the class action lawsuit against Champion Ferry. I've been in contact with two law firms. Of course, every law firm has a specialty in, within its own office. Class action lawsuit attorneys don't come as easily as a real estate attorney or an income tax attorney. So I've got two options called in to, and they are meeting with me, but I don't want it to be with me. I have other people that I have spoken to that would be interested in talking to these attorneys about how to go about this. My first question to these attorneys, their, their first question to me was, is it a private organization? Yes, it is. How many people live on the island? How many people are affected? I gave them the numbers. What is actually happening as far as safety for the residents of Harsons Island? I let them know about the dock. Everybody says, how can you live like that? We have no fire engine available, quick back and forth. We're talking emergency. Someone said, get a helicopter. And then we needed a barn to put a helicopter in to keep it warm. I'm being laughed at when I mention this to these attorneys. So, my first question to them was, who, who, who pays? You know, we all got to pay. When we had the meeting on Sunday, question was asked by Mr. Newman, who's willing to pay for an attorney? So I asked these two guys, and no cost, just visiting with them. Um, he said, we have to come up with a retainer fee. That would be one thing. If we were concerned about the cost of a class action lawsuit, not to worry about it, because the courts always go back and get the person that we're suing to take care of that. There would be no, that, that's just standard procedure. Any cost incurred, it's called damages. We are, that's one thing. The other thing, all right, the other thing I wanted to know is, is it okay for me to suggest to you that we open up an emergency fund for legal ex expenses? Yes. Second thing is, is that yes, we would demand that the, is a, um, the state take over this company, emergency like they did for the city of Detroit, take it over get an emergency management company in there, and you can do this much quicker legally with an attorney who will go right to the, to the meat of it, which happens to be our governor, knowing that we have this kind of support behind him. And he said that would be the quickest way to go. We can write letters, we can call, we can do all this. We need action now. This ice is gonna come. It's going to block the entrance to our ferries, entrance and exits, smashes up those makeshift docks, and he was welding something on that dock today as I was crossing it. 
that's just not going to hold up with this ice and the high water. So my thing is, let's get moving on this class action lawsuit and get it moving and get it run by a legitimate licensed contractor to build a safe means of transporting all of us back and forth at a reasonable cost. Who is we? We've gone way off course here, okay? Okay. Sure, thank you. And, and out of out of that conversation, that presentation, I wrote down two things. You know, the you know the the, the hire, hire an attorney for a class action lawsuit, and then also the state takeover of the ferry. Um, you know, I can I can ask those questions of of you know wherever I can in, in the state. To find that. Right. Well, I'll, I'll I'll just go back to you know as as we do for whenever a constituent calls and says, hey. Is this possible? Can this be done? We go back to Lansing and start asking and say, okay, what's the precedence for it? Has it ever been done? Can it be done? You know, just find out. You just start asking. Yep. Let's, I think I think I think we'll ask the owners if they're comfortable answering those questions. But I I want to at least preface it with, um, you know, we had a dock failure in Detroit last week, um, an active dock. Uh, you know, we've got roads washed out around the state. I mean, the the this the situation is is, you know, is is a natural disaster. And so I want to be careful about. Uh, how much how much we blame any any one person for something like this yeah yeah seriously i mean well, well all, I, all i'm saying is eight hours a day were working with two people to repair the ramp that was going to and from harson's island eight hours we have 24 hours in a day we had a two-man crew for five days i got people all over this island saying that could have been put back together in 36 hours yeah and it was structural integrity beyond what we have now that's already failed before Okay, and I'm not going to second guess that. All I'm going to say is that, you know, I that's what Where's you're that's what you're that's what you're observing is is two people owner. working. Uh, certainly, I was in contact with the people on the repairs. Um, I think the two people. I was in contact with with Bob. Okay, asked him if he needed any other assault. We asked him too. He right. Didn't take it. Right, because really what Bob said is that there isn't, there wasn't room for more contractors to be in there doing work and what they're doing. So, Bob Bryce. I know he doesn't, but he was doing the repairs. So, all right. And, 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 again, okay. So, I just want to, I want to make sure we're going to make a decision here. That's good. If if we want to dissect what happened over the last five days, and second guess whether all that was done as best and, and fast as it could be, we we can do that. Or we can continue to, to uh, try to identify what are all our, our alternatives and options. There's there's nothing there's nothing we're going to do here today that's going to change it tomorrow, right? Immediately, all the all the solutions we can look at are going to be longer term. They're going to take a little bit more time than in something immediate. Okay, you're not going to have a state takeover of a, of a private business happen tomorrow. All right, we we've, we've got. Well, it's being exacerbated by that, but our, our, yeah, I think so. But and what I also want to do is, I want to I want to know what what you because it's this meeting is here for you. If you want to spend the time trying to identify what are our potential alternatives for transportation to the island, or um, 
trying to make a decision as a committee as to whether the owners did the best job they could over the last five days. Okay. You picture it next to Bob Rice and maybe and you got it rough, but I know you started to try to explain. So you you took his you took his ear and you, you tried to take his purpose, his vision. But like Jim Newman said, he didn't talk to us first. And now you're talking to us, because now you're like, oh crap. And you're like, I have nothing to do with this. So I just want to know your purpose. I'm not Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Hi, Patrick Vian, Murphy Island. Uh, I, I'm listening to all this stuff. Everybody, understandably, is concerned. The biggest problem I see right now, Dan, thanks for coming and doing your part of explanation. I'm not thrilled with it, but the whole thing is there's an assumption here, right? And it's a big one. And that assumption is that the rate increase is not justified, okay? And that other people can run the ferry cheaper and we could all save a lot of money. If that's true, I'm the first one in line. But unfortunately, the key person that was supposed to be here was to explain to us how the rate increase was justified. Now, not one person in this room can answer that question other than the people that did the justification. And I submit, before we get into lawsuits and all this other crap, that we be clearly and specifically shown what is the prerequisite and what were the guidelines for the race and how was it met. That, we need to know that before you go in. He doesn't need it anymore. Thank you. I, I, I can give an answer to that because I, I don't think you can. I have You're not the Michigan State Board of Police. I right. had a conversation. And you with don't know nothing. I had a conversation with them, and this is the answer that I was given. We were given information by Champion Auto Ferry with comparable rates, and we had to, according to the law, approve those rates because they were less than the comparable rates that were provided to us. I asked them if they had done any research for, on their own. Any Jim, I got the same answer. So did other people sitting here in the room. It's not spelled out. I want to see it specifically. I want to see each one of those things. You can't just say, oh, we talked to somebody. I want to see specifically how they determined that's it. That's how they did it. They just explained it to you and they explained it to me. That's all is, is that correct, Dan? Is that correct? Is that correct? Uh -huh. That's the same explanation I've got to date. So what I've got down, Patrick, is to get an actual accounting from them. And, you know, they, there's got to be more detail to it to that, okay? So we can, right, we can do that. But I still think, you know, and, and I think it got glossed over. I'm going to come to you right next. Um, when I mentioned, you know, the Beaver Island example, you guys, and I don't think anyone's quite taken out of that, you know, if, if you, if one of the things you, I think you would want to be considering is if, if, because I believe you're right, I think everyone does think they could run this thing better, cheaper, faster, stronger, safer, everything. Um, 
if if that is the intent of the, of the residents and then you should be one of the options we should be talking about is is what is the Harsons Island Transportation Authority and how would you you know do you want to go down that road is that something you would want to investigate the the formation of what would it take to do so and, and what would it take to, to become an operating company to, to, to do just what is kind of being suggested without anybody exactly saying it so um, is that an option you want me to investigate with you can I comment on that what's that can I, can I comment on that I'm having a real hard time here and um, I just want to, I will already but I just missed the fellow in the back that here we said it, ex it exists already. It exists already. All right, right. I knew I knew there was out there, but what I'm asking is, it, is it something you want to continue? Yes. We, we looked at it once. We didn't. You know, we haven't gone back to it. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I, I, all right. Yeah. I mean, there was all kinds of rumors how I disbanded the uh, I call it Haida Harsons Island Transportation Authority. That is totally, totally not true. Could have, did not. Um, in fact, I talked to a few residents. Um, how it stands, it's, it's a five-member board. Now, the thing you got to be cautious too. Authority has a lot of power. Three people on this board could get together and actually put an excise tax on the, the the transportation going across the ferry and actually charge you more money, and it goes in the association um, or or the the authority. It, they have a lot of power, so. I, I get leery about that. But anyhow, right now, as the, the association was active in 2013, Dan re referenced the Beaver Island Ferry. Uh, myself, along with uh, Mr. Graytop, we were trying, and uh, I think it was uh, Jim, who, who, Jim Wilson from Blue Water Transportation Authority. He came to us. He goes, I think I got a good solution. He said that we could get Act 51 mo money that would pay for half the operating costs of the ferry. Great. Uh, we talked to the owners of the ferry, Dave Bryson, and, and we, were, we were going forward with that. We were trying to model it after the Beaver Island Ferry. Um, at that time, the Harsons Island Transportation Authority, you can't have two authorities over one entity. And long story short, they blocked Blue Water Transportation Authority from actually doing that. And, and Blue Water Transportation Authority backed off. And I, I, to this day, I think they've done a island or a really big injustice to the island. I was just talking to Bill yesterday. I mean, we we're, and how, how the makeup was. From 2013 to now, we were probably had only one rate increase if that went in effect by now. And your commuter rate would probably be about six bucks a round trip right now if that went in effect. I don't know if we can get back. I don't know if we can get get back to that or not. But going forward, um, I'm prepared to appoint people to Haida. Um, that's why I had a couple questions on the bill here. Uh, if uh, how much power or, or what, what kind of um, influence they could have. I know for a fact that. <laughs> For about 20, 25 years, uh, the, the Transportation Authority really didn't have too much luck influencing the MPSC or anything on the changes of rate hikes back in the 90s and early 2000. Like I say, 2013, they kind of blocked the Blue Water Transportation Authority, which really would have helped in my opinion, really would have helped out our island. It would pay for half the operating costs of the ferry. And this would have been through Act 51 money. And since it didn't go, that money is actually paying for a bus probably in Grand Rapids at midnight where no one's riding on it. That's where the money is. Um, going for, I, Dan, on, on, on the, the last sentence in, uh, Section 7, it says, a carrier by water that meets the criteria of this section is deemed a instrumentality, instrumentality of the state. What does that mean? That's a good, that's a good question, Artie. I, 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 the, the I looked it up, and I, I, I don't know what, what that means. It's, it's the it's criteria section is deemed a instrumentality. Got a, a lawyer in the audience? Well, no, let me finish. Right, let me finish. We'll get to that. The instrumentality of the state, it was discussing between two, it's 
something that's needed um, when for MDOC. So it's talking about being two uh, different M roads meeting. Okay. So they would be an instrumentality of the state. To connect the two. Or would not be, but that's a connection. Okay. To, that's where that came from, and that's why. And, and, and section two, well, under section seven, uh, paragraph two, this section does not apply to a carrier by water that is operating within a municipality under agreement with that municipality. Now, that would either be Clay Township or St. Clair County, it could be. So, potentially, we could, we could do some type of an operating agreement. And the... I think, and, and, I, I and that's think, what again, all the other companies do. And again, then this, this act would be null and void. Right. It, yeah. It, in the interest of time, we've got. So. Well, yeah, that's that's part of it. So what, what I've got down real quick, and I'll I'll work on it more later. But if we're looking at a at a Harrison's Island Transportation Authority, I've got down, you know, how how to form and use. Uh, what is their authority? What is their responsibility? You know, we'll start looking into all those get, get answers to those questions. But if if that's one of the options, I, I guess I'm still trying to keep moving here. We've got, um, and I'm try I want to get to all you, you know, and what your what your questions and ideas are. One one I do want to mention because he's been sitting here patiently this whole time is one of the other op op opportunities or uh, alternatives is a bridge that was discussed a number of years ago. Okay. So there's a, there's a representative here from Tran Central Transport. That's the company that's been investigating the bridge for a number of years, and and I can ask Paul if he's if he's willing just to give you an update as to where they are in that process and what the potential of it is. So, Paul Opsmer, if you want to address that. Thank you. My name is Paul Opsmer. I work for Matthew Maroon. I'm the director of the East Governmental Operations. Matthew is the third generation. It wasn't about sturgeon. No, the nesting grounds. It wasn't about sturgeon. It wasn't about sturgeon, but yes, we can move forward. Okay. Would you like to show a band to how many people here in the room would support the bridge? I would rather let you uh, talk with the township supervisor and uh, the local elected officials and the people on the island. We'd be glad to meet you. We need immediate. Thanks, thanks for coming. Bridges are not regulated. It would be competition to champion auto fares. Right. Okay. Uh,
More than that. With there it is. John Hanna, with Bill uh, Castle, with Don Burslick, um, and when his people were besieged, yes, it was very, very difficult to get the support of the islanders back then <coughs> and with Clay Township to further this um, Haida authority. And you're absolutely right. It has an enormous amount of authority. Enormous. But it was disbanded only because no one could it, it was not it was not disbanded and you're a member of Haida. You're right. And I can tell you that it, it had technically it is still on the book. It's not disbanded. It are it's technically still on the book. They Haida but became it's, inactive. It's inactive. Sorry, I used the wrong word. Yes. But there are people on this in this group who know about it, who worked with it after my husband died, so they know how to Okay, so we've got the we got that transportation authority as an option. We'll we'll continue to move forward on that. Do we have we're getting really short on time. So we ran over twenty five minutes. If we build the bridge, we have M one fifty four state highway. And you have M twenty four and state highway. Are you responsible for connect those two highways? Is the state responsible to connect highways? I guess that's a question I'll have to ask. You know, I can't I can't I mean I can't tell you for sure. Can I, you want to, so, so, sir, just for our correction on that, Grosiel has two bridges, one is a private bridge and one is a county bridge, all right? So the state doesn't provide either bridge. But the county, Wayne County, regulates the free bridge. Oh, okay. But just so we're clear, the state doesn't connect either one. I just wanted to make sure there was a clarification on that. And, and Drummond Island is very similar. They've got a ferry. It's 14 bucks. I mean, what's the 12 distance? bucks here. What's the distance? It's farther. Much yeah. farther. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. a pretty similar farther. situation. I mean, I think that's privately owned. I don't know. Yeah. Actually, Dr actually, Drummond Island is 50% is subsidized through the same Act 51 money. Yep. yep. Like if you did a, an authority type here. Okay. That's all that, right? Do we have? I'm sorry, I missed that question. <laughs> yes, sir. I've been waiting a while here. Yeah. I'm very familiar with being a business owner. My family's been a business, are business owners. Probably quite a few people in this room are business owners. We understand that, you know, Champion Tours is not a charity organization. However, with your bill specifically designed just for Champion Ferry, it gives him no um, restrictions on raising that. I have no problem with him making money. He needs to make money. He needs to pay himself a wage. He needs to pay the people that work for him a proper wage. A proper wage. Now, your bill takes all of that away. What can you do to reverse your bill? Well, today. we we can today. we can. Yeah. Well, there's Soon. there's nothing I can do today. Can you stay But what we can't. <clears throat> um, I don't know if we have the authority to do anything like that. You know. Um, but I can't. We can. We can look at legislative uh, alternatives for how the, how that how that rate increase is, is determined. You know that that's certainly a possibility. So um, I think you know. it's very the property owners of the islands that know that. Yep. 
I think it goes it goes yeah, it goes hand in hand. Yep, it goes hand in hand with ans answering a question that you raised, which is exactly how is it being determined. So um, certainly. 2019. If, if Dave or Jake's willing to address it, absolutely. You guys want to address that or no? You can turn the lights on this side back to Bob. Turn the lights on. I want to tell you how wonderful it is to be famous. <clears throat> As all of you know, or most of you know, we had an incident last week where the ferry eluded, they don't collide, they elude into the ferry dock. That caused the dock to fall into the water and it stopped service. Uh, I mean, it's regrettable that that happened and we apologize to all those that were inconvenienced and we did the maximum amount that we could to both restore the service and also to mitigate the impact that it had on all of you. With the help of Artie here and my other brother Bob, we established the little, the little boat to take you back and forth, and we did all that was humanly possible to alleviate any suffering that you might experience. <clears throat> In addition to that, we also applied, I guess, our engineering expertise and our marine construction experience to get the dock up out of the water and repaired. So from the time that it happened to the time that it went back into service, which was late Monday afternoon, I guess was about, what, five days. And considering the amount of damage that there was, considering the amount of work that needed to be done, and the resources that, that we put into it, I mean, it was a pretty astounding feat that we got it repaired so quickly. Compare that to the city of Elginac when they had about 50 or 60 feet of just their seawall along their boardwalk fall, fall out. That became damaged. It took them two years and over a million dollars just to fix a chunk of seawall. Uh, compare that to the Marine City Ferry that the ice took out the bridge on their causeway. They're still out of business. <clears throat> so as far as the amount of effort that went into getting us back in business, we don't have anything to hang our, shed, our, our heads in shame about. Um, <clears throat> I've heard a lot of talk here about taking the ferry over by the government. I mean, you can do that if you want, but keep in mind that's the same government that runs the ferries up at Drummond Island, Sugar Island, and Nebish Island, the Upper Peninsula ferries. Their prices, the first of the year, are going up to $20 a round trip per car. And keep in mind that that's matched 50-50, as you heard before, by the state. So they're actually collecting $40 per car. <coughs> and they're a break-even operation. So that's what you should compare our rates to. It's the $40 per car. <coughs> Hey, Dave, can I ask you a question? No. Tough. I, I think some people here have a, they, they don't really have a problem with the round trip rate, is the commuter rate. And uh, is, is there a possibility that we could put another buck on the round trip rate and drop the commuter rate as proposed? <coughs> Um, we, in talking to the state police, they were uncomfortable with doing that. 
and they were comfortable with the rates that we're currently at now. We, we didn't push the issue because we could easily have gone up to $15 and still been competitive with the rest of the, the other uh, ferry <coughs> operators. Do it on the single ticket. Do it. Take that. Take as high as you can. It's 15 bucks. That's okay. But it's the people that live on the island that have to come and go every day. And all, the, all of the other tourist people that come on weekends say the same thing. You use the ferry all the time. Why should we have to pay a premium? I, so it I, depends on who you're talking to, and I don't want to get into an argument about that. I think he did a great job. Just like you said, that was an incredible amount of work. I don't really know the guy. I have no interest in it. It's I heard amazing. I think it was fantastic. You know, it. You people are just so easy to just go yell at somebody and, and come up with this stuff. Sure. It's crazy. You know, you know, you know, okay, so I'll take I'll take a few questions as long as they don't get obscene. This guy's first. He's closest. said you were working on your parking lot, you were working on your seawall, and you said you wouldn't get that other dock ready until sometime in the spring, May, I think it was. That's where I think we have fault with you as far as repairs. <coughs> we were working on, as most of you know, we have a DEQ permit that we applied for a couple years ago <coughs> to put in two completely new ferry docks, and we're working on that. And then the high water level caused the existing ferry docks to be crushed by all the heavy traffic going across it. That's when we restricted the amount of weight that we would carry, and that happened in late August. <coughs> At that time, we switched our efforts from the existing main dock to the dock next to it, the lower dock, downstream dock. We're currently in the process of rebuilding that, but in order to rebuild it, you have to get down into the foundation. So that dock is being rebuilt. Instead of having a 15-foot ramp, it's having a 30-foot ramp. The foundation is being moved back 15 feet. We expect to have it done, and this is was a major question or a major issue for the state police as well. We expect to have it done next spring when the frost laws come off. So at that point, we will be able to haul the heavy trucks on that dock. That's the plan. Dave, can I, Dave, can I, can you explain that you have an engineer on staff, which is why your plans aren't required necessarily to go out to a third party engineer? Because I think some people in the crowd don't understand that. And I think that that's important for you to let everybody know that you have an engineer on staff. Can you just let, can you explain that, please? I am one of the engineers on staff. Right. But you have a certified, no, no, no. You have a certified engineer. But I'm a certified, you are, degreed yes. mechanical engineer. Right. Jake over there. There you go. He is also a mechanical engineer. Thank you. And he has a professional engineering license. There it so is. So he stamps the drawings. We send the drawings to the DEQ, they look at them, they review them, and they bless them, and then they issue the permit. So the engineer, basically, we're both marine engineers. What's the condition on the island's dock like? As you know, uh, the, island, the island has the all right. The island has the one recently built dock that we're using for the main dock. The middle dock has been crushed last summer, and that's obvious. The upper dock has been 
Well, we filled that up with stone, so we're able to use it. But again, that foundation, the, the actual foundation for the dock is underwater. And what happens when the foundation gets underwater and saturated is the dirt, the soil, turns to pudding. And it doesn't matter how much asphalt is on top of it, if the under, underlying structure to the dock or the road or whatever becomes saturated, it gets crushed by the heavy trucks. Sorry, you're gonna. I'm. <laughs> Did you say March before heavy trucks would be allowed? I said that we'll. Uh, the plan is for the dock to be completed by the time the frost laws come off next spring. Okay. And the other question is, according to your recent order for uh, increase, the order says that 60 days after the price increase, the commuter books will no longer be honored, even though the. Books say are good till December 2020. Can you explain that one? Says the <coughs> does? Yeah. No. <laughs> according, according, to the order, according, the, according to the written order, you have after the price increase. Right. The old books will no longer be honored. I thought it was 90 days, oh, but regardless. 90 days. 90 days. 90 no days. Be honored, even All though right. The books Says good till December 2020. Can you explain that? This goes back to the rule from the MTSC. Not anything that we've changed. It's been that way forever. We have selectively ignored it for many years. Is this something you're going to continue, or are you going to follow the way The way it works. Okay. So the way it works is that whenever we have a price change, you have, technically, you have 90 days to come in and turn in your old tickets, get credit for them, and you're issued a new book, you pay the difference. That's option A. Option B is you can continue to use the old tickets if you pay the price difference between the new and the old. So next year, you'll be able to continue to use your old ticket. You just pay an extra $2 with each ticket. Eventually, as the new docks become built, you'll have, you won't have as steep an incline. Now, the current dock, or the, the rebuilt docks that we're planning on now, we're having the base, the back end of the dock against the shore, to be at the same level as the road. The thinking or the theory behind that is that if the road is underwater, it's not going to matter if the dock is or not. And then the other half of that equation is that five years from now, when the water level drops five feet, we still need to be able to get down the ramp and get on the boat under those circumstances and conditions. That's why we're extending the docks, the length of them, from 15 feet out to 30 feet. Dave, I see you every morning, man. I see you uh, I'm and sorry. Like I said, mentioned earlier, that the city of Elginac, when they needed their seawall fixed, it cost them over a million dollars and they had to wait two years for the resources to get there. Nobody that we're aware of has the type of equipment that we have to do that type of a job, number one. And number two, the, well, when we were making this repair most recently, some of you may have noticed that my brother Bob pitched in, that the Olsen people pitched in. I mean, when there's 
something that needs to be done where it takes more than one or two people, we do get those resources, bring them in, and utilize them. Somebody repeat that. That's right. We're, we're, we're still continuing to do prefab work in the shop so that we can install assemblies as opposed to us install putting it together piece by piece outside. Um, I guess I could mention that we've done a preliminary analysis as to what caused the illusion. About two or three years ago, we undertook a program to replace all of the existing transmissions that are in the boat now with new modern electric shift transmissions at considerable cost to us, I might add, like about $50,000 each. And they've been working perfectly except until the most recent incident when the pilot was coming into the dock, and again, we had conditions like we have now out there, strong winds and waves. When the pilot was continuing into the dock, he shifted from forward into reverse on one engine, and the throttle did not throttle down. Mm -hmm. And part of the safety features of that new transmission are, is that it won't engage if the throttle is over is over a thousand rpm so that's what happened it shifted from forward into neutral but it would not shift into reverse and the other engine even though it was going in full reverse it didn't quite have enough power to stop it so it was an engineering failure not a pilot error or anything like that and believe me the coast guard and the manufacturer of that system are going to be getting involved with it. Stand up so I can hear you. David, a year ago you ordered a new ferry. Hmm? You ordered a new ferry a year ago, right? Uh, that's not correct. That's misinformation. That's what they say on their website. No. We, we ordered the design of a new ferry. That, that's correct. I mean, the design isn't even completed yet. Well, you did escrow a certain amount of money under the last provisions of your uh, oversight. You know, put a dollar or something into a fund for that purpose. <coughs> Going back into the history, back before 2015, the public's, we, we presented a letter to the Public Service Commission on those particular ferry docks on the mainland. It was a letter made by an engineer, a certified engineer, and at that time he told the Public Service Commission that those docks were in poor shape and that it would not be long until they would be red tagged. The Public Service Commission at that time chose to ignore the letter that we presented to them, and they tried to force us to raise the price of both commuter tickets and the full price cars by a dollar and that that extra dollar was to be put into a special fund that only the Public Service Commission controlled and only to be used for the purchase of a new ferry. We didn't think that that was fair. <sighs> First of all, and we had prioritized the docks to be replaced before we got a new ferry, and so we did not raise that price on you, the traveling public. And we were held in contempt for it. We had a big court case in Lansing about how I violated the Public Service Commission order, and they were going to actually put me in jail. For, yeah, for not following their rules, among others. Are those rules still in place? Pardon me? Are those rules or oversight that you had to follow then still in place? No. <clears throat> there are a few legacy rules from the old Public Service Commission that are still there, but as far as, I'm, as, far as I know, the state police is not <clears throat> pursuing that.
There is no agreement between the ferry company and any municipality, and historically that has always been because it's been such a divisive and political, politically charged issue that no municipality wanted to get involved with us. It wasn't at one at one point back in the old old days. The ferry was rates were controlled or set by the St. Clair County Board of Commissioners, and they were also set and controlled by the State of Michigan, the Public Service Commission. And back in the 70s, there was a case similar to what's going on now where there was a public outcry, and the County Board of Commissioners declined the rate increase while well, the State of Michigan approved it. So it wound up in court, and the court said that the Public Service Commission would have exclusive jurisdiction. If you went island ferries fall under that provision. Right. No statement about Carson's Island Ferry. According to committee testimony, proposed legislation would replace the existing metric for assessing rate increases, which applies to utilities, with a reasonable standard that would more accurately reflect the function of the ferry. <coughs> No, it does not. It does not. <coughs> Selectively ignores it. No, it does not. What it, what it means is that if you did something like the height of that you're talking about, then the door is open. That, then you would have the, then you would have that relationship with the municipality, and the whole thing would be different. And That's this bill would not apply. At. Right. That's Excellent. what I brought up earlier. The bill would not apply. Yes. Right. That bill does not apply to anyone who has an agreement with a local municipality. And it could be the township or the county in this instance. Okay. Real quick, um, two things. Number one, justifying the, the $2 increase. A lot of us are kind of confused about that because we just had an increase two years ago. And, you know, in, in the bill that uh, Senator Lowers had uh, put in the law, there's no audit. There's no checks to see, hey, where's all the money going that we are getting paid? And secondly, um, was any consideration given to the amount of money that folks on the island can afford to pay? Because quite honestly, I've since since last week, I'm not paying you any money. I've been going across like by foot because I have to save those opportunities to cross the I pay because I can't afford it anymore. And I'll tell you, if, if, you, if your rate was more reasonable, if people would be, we would, we, we'd be lined up to give you our money. We would use it more. And every time there's an empty spot on your ferry, that costs you money. An empty seat in a the theater costs the theater money. We would use it more. You're, use, you're making the same amount of trips, you'll be shuttling more stuff. First of all, the state's attitude or position is, well, they have a policy of making bigger boats that hold more cars and giving you less service. 
So if they have a 24 car ferry, they'll wait a half an hour before they leave. And they actually have public schedules for that. <clears throat> Our theory is that we're here to give you good service. So we have smaller boats, more of them. We run more during the summer and we go back and forth whether the boat is full or not. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, we could easily have raised the prices to $15 instead because I'm also a member of the community. We only went to $12. You may whine and complain and everybody can wring their hands about the amount of the increase percentage wise, but what you have to realize is that when we made the switch or the jump from being regulated by the utility people, the Public Service Commission, to the state police, we were losing money. And if that switch had not been made, we would be out of business, period. This increase was mandatory for you to remain in business? I don't mind somebody making money. But when you have people that communicate, it's not a luxury for us. We have to have that. We have to have that ability. I understand that, you but raise your individual ticket price. Raise that money. You know, those are the people that are getting the experience of the ferry. They're enjoying that. They're coming to the island. They have a good time. You know, that, that's that's different. No, it's not different. Uh, respectfully, because the, all the people that come to the island, you don't go there unless you have a place to go. Nobody comes to the island joy riding. Oh, I, I understand. I understand. I understand. That's right. And what happens, as common sense will tell all of you, is that when we raise the price of the full fare for cars, that just drives more and more people to buy discount tickets. And right now, right now, it's not even, we're not even requiring you to use all the tickets. There is no restriction on you buying a book of tickets and splitting them up amongst your friends. No, we would not. Tell them two more questions. I'm going to get them off. Why, uh, why don't you tell me? Because there is no one to <clears throat> inspect it. There are no, there's no such thing as a federal dock inspector, a state dock inspector, a county dock inspector. When you have a dock built in front of your house, nobody comes around to inspect it. Well, I have to disagree with that. He had to apply for a permit yeah. for a dock. You have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's different. Only for electrical. Two, can I? All right, hold on. Two more questions for Mr. Bryson, and then we need to move on to finish the rest of this. So, two more questions for Mr. Bryson. I, I, I have a real quick question. Do you pay motor fuel tax on diesel? We do not. We do not. We are exempt. It's do not marine owe diesel. Any money from the motor fuel tax. That's correct. Designated for we we we, yeah, we nobody we, does for marine diesel. We receive no Act 51 money. You have to speak up. The cost of 
Uh, the, the operating cost. Yeah. 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 The fuel operating cost is a small part of the overall cost of operating the business. If the fuel cost goes down, that doesn't mean that insurance costs aren't going to go up along labor costs and everything else. So it's all blended together. Pardon me? Well, you, you can come over and look at it yourself. Just walk out on it and... <laughs> So, all right. Okay. So, Mr. Bryson, thank you so much for taking time to, to come up and answer questions. Um, and I'd like to, to get back to Senator Lowers to, to wrap up the, the rest of this. So, I want to thank you. Well, I was, I was writing pretty quickly as we were moving through things, but what I'd like to do is go through it as best I can and, and read you the notes that I'm taking forward as basically action items for me to research or get answers back. And then, um, Jill, I think you had a sign-on sheet for people that want information or something. Yeah, it'll be back out there. Well, I, so, you know, of course, all the information will be conveyed um, <coughs> to Artie. Um, and, I'm, and we have, we have uh, and I don't know if that needs to be updated or not, we had a couple old contacts for the Harsons Island Transportation Association. Um, but use the sign-up sheet in the back to make sure you get direct information. Um, most of you have my cell phone number. Anyone that doesn't, talk to somebody that does. Most of you have it. Um, and I have one final thing when you're done. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go through the list here, folks, and if there's stuff I'm missing, um, or if I need correction, let me know. So, uh, man, I wrote too fast. Okay, the the working on the no wake zone and the regulation of the no wake zone. Um, actually, Legislative Service Bureau is the is the the nonpartisan body we use in Lansing on that. That's already in process, just so you know. But we'll continue to follow up on that. Um, antitrust does it apply? Um, can, it, can it apply in this antitrust? Can does that apply? So that's one of the things they have down. Um, uh, the class action lawsuit um, and creating a citizens fund. Um, I will look into what that takes, and I assume you guys would be looking into that as well, um, just to communicate the answers to you. Um, uh, state takeover of the ferry via emergency management. Um, I've got that down. Uh, how does the MSP justify the rate increases? We'll get you that answer. Yeah, specifically. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. More specific than the answers they've given us. Yep. Uh, the Harsons Island Transportation Authority. You heard me talking about the, the different questions I asked there. If you think of other things we need to know about that, just communicate them to my office. We'll make sure we get them answered. But you know, uh, how to far, form and use it. Uh, which what is the authority? of such an organization and what are the responsibilities of such an organization. Um, let's see. Hmm. I may have to come back to that one. That's terrible when you can't read your own writing, isn't it? Going too fast. Oh, what is... Well, yeah, <laughs> Jill's actually can read my writing better than I can. She has to do it all the time. The bridge, we talked about that. Any, any updates that come will... We'll continue on that. Um, yeah, I can't read that one. Is, is the state responsible uh, for connecting the two state highways? Can and how would the legislature be, uh, can the legislation be changed uh, to provide com community? And this is where I do need some help. I wrote input in quotes with a question mark. I'm not sure quite how to phrase that, but into rate cases. You know what I'm trying to capture there? They, they, they want the community review, in, uh, input of, right. of, of, right. of when they... Uh, to really, I understand when I completely, I have a hard time figuring out how to do it, that's all. Because it's, you know, um, how do you... Uh, Dave, can you add to that? Um, we would like a formal uh, response by the governor by 
she asked that the state police not show up at the same time. He can ask. Jim, I, I, Jim I, I think that's up to the governor whether she's going to provide a formal response or not. That that would be very difficult for anybody to force, right? I'm, we're inquiring. We're inquiring. Now we'd like you to inquire. I can, I'll, I'll inquire, but it, you, you have to know we did it, of course, yesterday when we got the no. In fact, I believe my staff's words were, you better call me before you tell me no. Um, and so they called to say we're calling you before we tell you no. Yeah, we, so, we, we had a lot of questions for the MSP, and I did. And uh, I'm very disappointed that they are not here. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's a, that, that's, that really gets in a lot of politics that and, uh, probably won't help us. but Yeah. Um, and a plan for getting heavier trucks and materials over. I think we heard the answer to that is when the frost laws come off. Frost laws usually come off of St. Patrick's Day is kind of what I always remember because I yeah, have been in the heavy truck business. No, 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 usually the second week of January, fourth week of January, somewhere in there, mid-February, somewhere in there. And then the limit, I believe, is six weeks. What's the limitation on? I don't know. Uh, we had the DOT people here. They could tell there's a limit how far they can go. So, is, is there also an, uh, maybe a possibility to ask the road commission to free up the road mix that's on the island right now for some people to bolster their property? We were planning we, to the I, we're I, asking that stuff back yeah, in August. Yeah, I, I asked them about that, and uh, they basically told me, and I think I'd still get the same answer that stone is for building up the roads when the the water goes up this the the road commission owns that stone and they they, they feel they're going to need that over there to build up the roads during the high water coming right. can, can they order more? no <laughs> well it's a freighter load and it's it's very hard to get a freighter load uh delivered and it, it could be another year before they get it Right. In the oil field, we can't haul oil basically for two months if it's a bad year in the spring. So if we don't do something now to get dirt, to haul it down, to get it placed, the cross laws come on, the state won't help us, you won't be able to haul what could be available until May. So you're, you're out of pocket five months. What can you do to help us? Yeah. I s seriously don't know. I I was really trying to get that sand delivered to the islands, Russell Island, Harsons Island, and over here, that the Corps of Engineers was dredging, and that I failed to do that because we didn't get the uh, the governor didn't sign the letter of emergency that would open the door for us to be able to do that. Um, well, but I'll I'll follow up on that one too. You know, I I talk to Lake Carriers Association all the time. You know, I've been trying to. Trying to get our bail spur laws. You guys probably know about that too. We've got only until the middle of yeah, February before we're going to get the yeah, sure. cross laws yeah. potentially. Yeah. So we only have 60 days. No. Yeah, it'll be Is tough. Is there a point that if the water goes up, we might lose our electricity, water? Any idea? Like what that would take? So uh, obviously, if it if it if it is near impacting an electrical panel or your electrical service point, then yes, they, uh, they potentially would come and pull the meter and then go from there. Um, that, that could potentially be when it would, would impact individual households. There were a couple right. of houses last summer where we had to pull the meter because that happened. Um, no, we're not going to. No, 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 We're, no, 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 we're no, no, not going to pull no. the power on the whole island. No, it's a case no. by case, and, and it's yeah. either called by my building inspector or the fire, fire chief. chief. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a little bit of rumor going around different social media. The ferry would be closing down on Thursday for an inspection. Fake news. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Yep. Fake news. So, yep. There was one thing I wanted to explain real quick, um, and I wanted to make sure that everybody got it because I got a couple of very interesting emails, and I want to make sure it's very clear. So 
The question I got throughout this incident was, why was this not a state of emergency, right? So that, that came up a lot, and I see a lot of heads shaking yes. All right, so things like tornadoes where people's houses are wiped out and, and, and they have no shelter, they have nothing to go back to, things like that, where there's major, major damage, lives are are changed and ruined and people have lost their lives and are, are things like that, right? Hurricanes, major floods where we're, we have flooding in homes that are majorly damaged over 18 inches where they've lost the first floor of their house. Um, forest fires, major forest fires, things like that, okay? Those are states of emergency. First off, the local element has to declare what's called the local emergency and then the county would take up and declare a county state of emergency where the county chair signs a letter to the governor requesting a state of emergency. Okay, so here's from, from the county emergency manager's perspective, everybody on the island had heat in their home, they had electricity, they had, we had ability to deliver food, okay, at all times, we had ability to provide immediate medical care. We had an ALS unit on the island. We had a state approved transport plan should you need to come off the island. We had tertiary care uh, if we needed to provide something other than that, that state approved transport plan, all right? Everybody was safe on the island. Um, what we had was a transportation incident, it was not by Public Act 390 in the state of Michigan and by uh, County Resolution 0917 uh, for St. Clair County, it was not what is referred to as a state of emergency, okay? So I just wanted to cover that with everybody so you understand why I didn't declare a state of emergency for St. Clair County for Clay Township and Harsons Island, all right? Real quick, I wanted to ask, are there any questions on that? And, and let's leave it to one or two. Yeah, yes, sir. The data that we heard from the DQ and all of the projections and how high we are relative to now going forward, July, August being the high point, does that data feed into getting proactive considerations for a state of emergency, or it just has to happen before something starts? So, so I declared a local, or I declared a state of emergency on August 12th, but we worked with the locals to start declaring local emergencies. We I declared think in, ours late, in, way before. Like in May, right? Yeah, May. So, so yes. Is now a time in January? To no, my, because my, my state of emergency is still in effect. It's still in effect. They're still going. So we are going to end it December 31st and then start a new one probably in March, right? But that's the way those things work. But for this incident, I wanted to explain to everybody that is why it was not a state of emergency. Are there any questions on this incident on why Justin did not declare a state of emergency? No? Okay. Can you cover what the limitations are when you do? What time? And if any, yeah, for, for time purposes, if anybody has any questions on what that means, what a state of emergency means, please meet with me, please meet with me afterwards and we can talk through the process of what it means and what it does and how it works, okay? Yes, sir. Just to clarify. from the Corps of Engineers and various dredging operations. Sure. Um, and the thought was to have it dropped at various points on the island so it could be used for you know, flood and fill. Right. And Artie, you said you couldn't get that done. Could not? No. That, how can we get that specific thing done? So, we are, yeah, go ahead. So between the Army Corps of Engineers, the Depart Eagle, Eagle, I think, is the kingpin in all of this. Right. And uh, there's a process that we're going to have to continue to go through with them. And they had a pretty big switch over, which I think we're going to have to work through with them. Um, but Eagle is the linchpin in that whole thing. And if we can get the process worked through with Eagle, uh, there has to be some, some testing done wherever we're going to, wherever we're going to pull the bottom from, that has to be sampled. And then we also have to ensure there's a plan wherever we're going to drop it to, all right? And so both of those things have to be worked out. 
then it has to be permitted, and then, uh, and then we're off and running. Now, that's, I can say that out loud. That sounds pretty simple, uh, but yet I, it'll be a, a little bit of a lengthy process. When we, when we did the crisp and green, we went through that, so we got some familiarity. Right. We do. Yeah. Right. And so everybody knows Agel is Environment, Great Lakes Energy. It's the new DEQ. Right. Bigger and badder than ever before. Yes. How do you expect answers to the questions that you're going to ask Lansing? When can you expect? I, I, you know, we'll start working on them right away. We are one week from Christmas, and don't, my only limitation will be responses, getting responses from the departments that I'll be contacting. So, you know. Do you have anything for like any estimate for any question, any answer to any question? The, the ones that the ones that are easier to answer, I'll I'll have sooner. How are they going to be funneled to us? You have to fill well, out. The if you want direct fill contact, out. fill out the form on the way out. Okay. Otherwise, the information will go to Clay Township and to the Harsons Island so like Transportation. Or six or oh gosh, no, not a uh, six-month type thing. So give us a little yeah. January. Uh, yeah, when everybody's back from okay. the holidays. Right now, when you call the departments, you get a lot of people gone. Is all, the only reason I'm hedging on this at all. Otherwise, it, it, it should you know it should be next That's week, one week, two week type thing. Yeah. Hey Dan. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, getting back to the this rate increase, I, I I'm really appalled that the Michigan State Police is not here because I was going to ask them if there was a possibility we could divert and ask my dear brother David if we could divert a dollar. Uh, from the commuter rate and put that on the round trip ticket. And uh, I don't know if David would be willing or not to do that and if they could somehow approve that or not. And I also wanted them to look at, um, you know, municipalities use the ferry too. And I, I know the, the new price for the school bus is going to be 30 bucks. And it's not that big of a bus and it's not that heavy. It's if there's some way that we can get a special rate or a special consideration for the school bus. And then also on, on our fire department, I they, the ferry lets the police go across free and I thank them for that every day. Um, the, the fire department used to have free access, but truthfully it was abused and it was pulled away. But I'd like to at least have the fire department, if they're responding to an emergency, some consideration for them too. Not when they're going back and forth to work or, or anything else, but during when there's an emergency, I'd like to have some consideration for that too. And am I still on your Christmas list, David? <laughs> um, he shook his head. Huh? Right, he shook if, we his head. if we do. One more question and, and wrap yep. it up. I know we're losing a lot of people as we go here. Um, this, ma'am, you had a Has question. Has anybody actually asked the freighter company when they would be able to drop it on the road? As a, a site we have that a section, a, a spot. Yeah. Oh, for for the county? Right. Yeah, well, first they would have to make room. Now, I know from the. Make room. I, I, yeah, I know we can. I, I know from the, uh, the county's roads or perspective. They had a five-year deal uh, for stone at, for a price, and it is really competitive now. So they loaded all the stone they can get, you know, on that on the island be, just because they got it. It's it's a good deal. And January first, uh, I think it goes up so, substantial. So you see, we so. have to have a place. If we have the knowledge that we need a place, we can probably give the place to put it. Well. I don't think the boom would reach. No, the boom would not reach. No, the, yeah. the boom wouldn't reach. I was actually going to look, at, talk to Sunset next door, okay. and see if there was a way we could. They're going to require that it, the the it cannot run back into the water. So we'd have to put up a clay berm, and but again, that's private property. I would I would have to to talk to Sunset about getting material there. So the other question is. With them. Calling, the freighter company, the American Steamship, the one that delivered this last month. Mm -hmm. And you get zero responses via email or even phone calls. Right. You leave message after message. How do we actually keep and find out if they can even, I mean, 
That's one thing we got to look at. I did put it down. That's one thing we got to look at. Follow up and, and because I do talk to Lake Carriers Association, I can kind of work backwards to those yeah. people. So I'll do that. Because if we can get it, then we can right. even worry harder right. about what we got to do with it. Yep. It's on here. We got, I got it on there. We got. Oh, there's, we got, we got two. Got two going at once. I can't hear either one of you. I didn't hear. I, 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 sorry, we. Can Can you re repeat the the question? I, How much water is leaving the system? The, the outflow from the Great Lakes Bay. Is there any way to? I, any way to increase the outflow from the Great Lakes Basin as a whole or from Lake St. Clair or? Sure, sure. So the, out, the outlet, the outlet. The outlet for the entire Great Lakes Basin, the, the vast majority of that water leaves via the St. Lawrence Seaway, being an international, uh, internationally approved regulation plan. And that, 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 the board that operates that regulation plan is called the Lake, Lake Ontario St. Lawrence Board, falls under the influence of the International Joint Commission. But that outflow regulation has no impact on any other lake but Lake Ontario because of Niagara Falls. There's a lot of, a lot of that good information in that bridge article that I try to get around to everybody. It talks about the actual inflow outflow, what, what the maximum can be done, and, and all those things. So, this yeah, is Mike. Just a, one question. This is a good forum for all parties. I think we got a lot on the table, we got out of our bubbles, and collectively came together to have good, healthy, productive dialogue around all this topic. Are we on the agenda get to gather maybe in 30, 45 more days, knowing this situation is going to continue, where we can have a forum like this, where we can hear from the owner, we can hear from our constituents, we can hear from the public, and see this as a process to get through next summer as the high water becomes more uh, of an issue, and, and, and all the issues we just And maybe the, even the Michigan State Police. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah I, think, I think so, Mike. And just so everybody knows, I, I hope you picked it up during this meeting that a lot of the people up here, especially with Justin being a key, you know, we've been talking about this stuff since May. Um, a lot of what we're talking about, you know. So. Yeah, in the information, you're. you're I mean, this right, is the second time in 45 days that I've done this, okay. right? So, but I think I showed up and there was four people in the audience. So. Right. And I've seen this the third time I've seen this presentation. So it's not being kept secret. It's just. Yeah. Whether you happen to hear about that meeting that's going on with where the operations, yeah. but yeah, yeah, we'll it, we, you know, we've been working really hard, and, and it's frustrating uh, between myself, Justin, well, even Dan and the core. I mean, we've talked to countless agencies. We have everyone says, "What's an emergency plan?" We have several emergency plans and contingencies. I even mentioned in, in the, in you know. We could we could call Patrick and and how long would it take you to get a floating bridge across the river? <laughs> I, don't I, mean, have a, I don't have a time for that. It's, one. it's a plan. It's, it's part of the plan. But I mean, we have many contingency plans that, that, that we've looked at. All right. Thanks, so, everybody. We'll, all right. We'll see. Thank Thank you all. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> Good job, folks.